Grace Foods is my business. I'm Lauren Gray. Um, I'm married to Josh Gray, who runs Newman and Gray Boat Yard, and my mother-in-law, Jane Gray. So uh, that's my connection to the island. And I originally came to um, GCI Summers and did a lot of odd jobs. Come on in! And um, I was odd jobbing, and then I eventually became the teacher um, for the Cranberry Isles for five years full time, K through eight. Uh, my partner teacher was Audrey Nother. We had a really good time, and I got to the end of teaching, and I was thinking, now what? Um, I was summering, um, starting on a lobster boat, and I started to get interested in aquaculture. And about that time, the Island Institute had put out um, a call to join an aquaculture cohort. I had some friends that were starting an oyster company on Mount Desert Island, the Bar Harbor Oyster Company, and I had been helping them. And so that's kind of how I came about joining the aquaculture cohort with the Island Institute. Um, so I switched from teaching to oyster farming. And I sort of had both going at the same time for a little while because it takes an oyster three to four years to grow to size in Maine because the water is very cold, especially up here. Down in southern Maine, they get more like two and a half, three years, but it's kind of like, you know, if you compare it to asparagus where you're planning for the future. <laughs> so I put oysters in the water for the first year um, in 2016 and I was on what's called LPAs, or limited purpose aquaculture leases. And there are one year renewable leases. So very small, 400 square feet sites. And so you can't make a lot of investment in the future. Um, so I started immediately working toward what's called a standard lease, which is a very long, expensive process. Um, I began selling oysters, uh, just a few in 2018. And by 2020, I'd secured the standard lease. So this is just the flow chart of the steps that it takes to get a standard lease. It was very um, long term. It probably took me a year to go through the process. And it took about 60 pages of documentation, uh, two public hearings. So they really, it's a great way to sort of like weed out the faint hearted and you know, I think it's a good thing that people have to go through that process because it does, you know, give you an idea of the type of um, expense that it involves. So once I started oyster farming, um, there's lots of different ways to grow oysters. You can do surface culture and bottom culture. I do what's called surface culture. So all the oysters are grown on the surface of the water. And to do that, I use um, oyster grow systems. And it's like two floats, and then there's cages beneath the surface of the water. And in those um, cages, there's bags, and the bags contain the oysters. And so the oysters grow with the water flow. So they're really dependent on temperature and water flow to grow. So that surface water moving is very important. Um, my father-in-law made me a tumbler, which is also another important piece of equipment, and that kind of breaks the outer edge off the shell and shapes the oysters. Um, so he made me that, you know, he saved me a lot of money there, made me that piece of equipment for about $500, and those are about $10,000. So, really good people in my camp. <laughs> um, and then I acquired this boat, and my husband helped me glass in like a hauling station and get set up for some heavy lifting and it's all solar powered which is really nice. Lauren, is it a chance to ask you a question about this at this time? Um, or do you want to wait till the end? Sure, we can go now. Go ahead. You want you want to, can you explain why you wanted to shape the oysters? Yes, yeah. So oysters, sure. I'll get to that a little bit more in the later part of the presentation, but oysters, um, can grow out very quickly and they can get very thin and the shell is very chippy mm -hmm. and weak and so we constantly want to be shaping them because a wider oyster with a good shell quality is better for the half shell market um, but there's lots of different ways to grow oysters and lots of you know different markets so that is particularly what i wanted um uh, yes. 
What was the reason you chose going the surface route as opposed to on the bottom? The bottom culture um, is a lot more unpredictable. Um, you can get a huge mortality just depending on um, whatever creatures you have. I knew there were a ton of green crabs in the pool, and so I didn't know enough about how that would affect the yield that I would get. It also takes a longer time usually to grow oysters on bottom. So surface culture was, I was more familiar with it. That's what my friends were doing at Bar Harbor Oyster. I knew how to do it. So that's why I wanted to stick with that. Um, I'm kind of exploring bottom culture a little bit more now. So it's, it's friendlier for people that are looking out on the water and don't want to see oyster cages, but a big shout out to the Cranberry Isles um, that the members that attended my uh, lease process were very supportive um, and that's rare. Uh, you don't really get communities that um, want to see working waterfront as much anymore and the people that came to my lease process were supportive. But of, we did ask you questions and yeah, you were we, on the spot. <laughs> I mean, I you you definitely question. knew what you were talking about. But right. yeah, right. and I think that is so important for sustainability and making yeah. sure that there's you know year-round population. So <laughs> I did just want to say that folks that I take on the shuttle going down the island from the scenic view across the McDonald's house. We always talk about the oyster time, so there's always a lot of who's and ahs. Oh, and and yeah. So you're getting a lot of positive uh, yeah. support that way. It's <laughs> funny, you know, like there's a big pushback from, you know, they'll call themselves like friends groups, like friends of Casco Bay or friends, and they basically are just not wanting to have a shorefront home and look out and see the oyster cages at the surface of the water, but I have to say, like, I get so many kayakers that mm -hmm. come through and are just curious and want to look and see how the farm works, so it's really positive interaction out here, and I'm grateful for that. I, I know that's not everywhere, so it's a special community, so. Um, yeah, so anyways, and in the lease process, I had to show, you know, People were able to publicly comment um, about their questions and concerns. I also had to show that I wasn't interfering with any lobster fishing or public recreation. And on top of that, they did a dive on the site and observed the site. The DMR officials came out to make sure um, I wasn't threatening any migratory bird habitat or endangered species. So um, that was very thorough and good. Anyway. So yeah, this is kind of what it looks like. This is the tumbler in action. Um, and this is my father-in-law just taking oysters and feeding them through. It's kind of like a bingo sorting machine and it sorts them by size. And that goes back to the growth. You always want to increase the water flow. So every time I can put oysters in a larger mesh size bag, I can increase the water flow. They can get more food because they're filtering that phytoplankton at the surface of the water. And then here are those oyster cages, and these are, these are Bar Harbor oysters cages, and they're just loading them up with those bags containing the oysters. You can kind of see what the process looks like. So, um, uh, excuse me. Yeah. How often do you have to tumble them? Um, I try to tumble them twice. Uh, it's pretty, it's like a long, twice, uh, twice a summer. I see. Yeah. And then I'm constantly hand sorting. All the oysters that I harvest are hand picked, hand selected. So that's just every day kind of sorting and selecting. Um, and then this is what they look like when I get them. So they're teeny tiny. Every farm um, on the coast of Maine has to get oysters from one of two approved hatcheries in the state. So the industry is very regulated because right now it's quite disease free. So you can't just go buy oysters from Virginia or Florida and bring them here. You have to get oysters from approved hatcheries and they have to follow specific protocols. So they're really tiny. That's a probably about a nine to 13 millimeter oyster, but they come as small as two millimeters. Mm. Um, and all, pretty much all oysters that grow in this state are Eastern or American oysters. So they're all the same oyster. Yeah. When I lived out in Washington State, you could harvest oysters, but you had to throw the shells back in the water because I wasn't told that's where the baby 
Yes. Yeah, we don't get uh, as much like natural settlement here because the water's so cold. The water has to be above 70 for oysters to naturally reproduce, oh. but um, creating those shell reefs does allow oysters. That's what they settle on when the, when it's, when the spat is floating in the water, so. How do they reproduce? They reproduce, they just kind of, um, like the male and female, they like send clouds up into the water and then, you know, those, the egg and the sperm beat and then they sink down to the bottom once they get to a certain size. Cloud so then that's where they attach to the shells at the bottom. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, you don't, as a farmer, you don't want your oysters to reproduce because um, they kind of have, it, it affects the quality of the oyster, so. Um, so this is what Maine looks like right now. So there's over 150 farms. Um, it's an $11 million industry. So that's tiny compared to the lobster industry, which is 600 million, <laughs> but it's growing. And so it's an exciting time to be an oyster farmer. Uh, there's this thing called the Maine Oyster Trail and you can check it out online. They have uh, little check-ins, QR codes at each farm. And if you check in at the farm, there's free stuff that they send you once you check into multiple farms. So you could probably check into mine and Scott's and get a free koozie or something. So you're um, part of that uh, yeah, benefit? Yeah, I'm part of that. Um, so yeah, we have quite a few farms. It's a growing industry. Um, and then this is Ned Swain. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but, um, the thing about oysters, I was saying that they're all the same species in Maine, and what makes them different is what's called their miroir. So just like wine um, has terroir, oysters have miroir. So it's like the flavor of the sea or whatever, wherever they're growing, the specific elements that are there. So just like France has all these different um, regions that their wines are known for, oysters in Maine, there's so much going on in the water, the type of phytoplankton that they're filtering, the type of environment, if they're in an estuary or if they're offshore, the salinity measures, all of that affects the flavor of the oyster and um, how they're grown also really affects the flavor because it affects the content, the meat content of the oyster. How did you choose the location where you have them? That's a good question. So I started with LPAs, which are those limited purpose um, leases. And so I tried a few different locations. I was most interested in the pool because the temperature was slightly higher, mm -hmm. but high temperature doesn't always mean great growth. You really need a lot of current. So the pool isn't the only place to grow oysters. I was growing oysters outside the pool before I began. I also chose that space because it's the most protected. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to make sure that if I had a lot of floating gear up in the fall that I wouldn't get taken away with a storm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, each site has unique growing conditions and it affects the flavor profile. So just how the tide is moving, the current, uh, whatever's growing there, if it's a salt marsh or um, all those kind of things, the temperature of the water. And so I landed on the pool um, and that's where I have my five acre farm. Um, this is the briny babe and she is kind of an oyster celebrity in Maine. And this is just to show she has like, she goes and she reviews different farms and she's got an Instagram account. And so this is just going back to all oysters are the same species, but they're so different based on where they're grown and who's farming them. So these oysters are all basically cousins, but you can see how different they end up. Um, you know, green with a specific type of algae or the sort of like white shell. Um, and then the shape is all about the farming and the density and how they're tumbled and if they're bottom grown or surface grown. So all these subtleties kind of come out. Um, I like this quote, this, I read it early on, it says, oysters seem to thrive on tender, loving, care, and affection. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time with my oysters, and yeah, I'm really going for shell quality and shape, cup and meat content, and then consistency, of course. Um, everything you do affects how the oyster is grown. So if you grow oysters densely packed together, they'll be long and skinny, so if you see 
those, you know that they were like tight in with other oysters. Um, if you don't tumble your oysters and you're in a fast growing condition where it's very warm, they'll get very thin and long and the shell might be very chippy. All oysters in the summertime get sort of an outer, they're growing very quickly out and so there's like a thin sort of ring around the outside, that's all the new growth. And so that is always a little bit chippy, but you don't want the whole oyster to be um, thin and delicate like that. Is that one of yours? Yes, yeah. These so they've gotten big. are mine, like the two pictures on the side and then the one in the middle is my harbor oyster. I don't do a lot of shucking events, so that's what they have, a, a tray um, of all their shucked oysters. Can and you tell how old they are according to the layers? Yeah, you can tell when they've had the big growth spurts, so you know you can see okay. like three okay. years on the rings on that one. Um, mm. It's kind of like you see those big sections of growth that mean July and August, there's summertime growth. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of paying attention, a lot of trying to get that consistency and shape. Um, and that's why two farms that are right next to each other can have completely different looking oysters or completely different tasting oysters based on whether they're grown on the bottom of the surface and all those different variables. Hmm. And what's cool is uh, the industry really celebrates that. So it's a very friendly industry. Um, and it's kind of like microbrews or wines where you're celebrating the differences um, and restaurants want to have multiple oysters usually on their menu so that people that are into oysters can say like, oh, I love those, I want to try these. And you can see the different, you can taste the different profiles. Um, also, even though oysters are all kind of cousins in the same species, there's different people. This is Scully Sea Products, Barbara Scully. She's selling giant oysters and then also cocktail oysters. So that's like a consumer preference as well. Um, if you like a giant oyster and you want to have, you know, quite a big gulp or slurp, I like to sell cocktail oysters, which are a little smaller and more user friendly, but different consumers have different preferences. I have people that always ask me like, when are you going to sell the really big ones? And, you know, there are people that love those. Kind so of I got to ask this question before I run out of giant time. lobster. <laughs> you know, I've got to ask this question. Is it a myth or is it actual that, that they are, they're considered aphrodisiacs? I knew someone was going to ask well, that question. Well, we have to ask. <laughs> so I have no data to know, back that up. But oh, you don't know where it came, that idea came from? Or I when? don't know anything about it, no. So I do hear that quite often. But yeah, I don't have any charts or graphs to prove that. <laughs> so I guess it's just a personal experience. So okay. just how big can an oyster grow? They can grow um, probably about like four to six inches. Um, I've not had any, I probably have had some that have gotten like four to five, but none that have gotten like really mammoths, so. Um, yeah. And so that kind of, question. Yes. <laughs> you find pearls? Yeah, you, um, <laughs> I've never found a pearl, but pearls do exist in Maine oysters. I guess they're just not as pretty as the ones that you would oh. purchase. So yeah, anytime that like sediment gets in the shell, I've never, never found one, no. Um, okay, so are they good for you? They're great for you. So oysters are a great source of protein Zinc, that's wow. low fat, tons of Whoa. vitamins, including a lot of um, copper, iron, zinc, and e. so they're really delicious and good for you. Um, and you can cook them a lot of different ways. So people like to grill them. I've had friends this summer that have been grilling them with like miso butter, mm. and that was delicious. My personal preference is just to have an oyster. This is one of my oysters, just like in a nice place, totally plain with a good view of water. So I think that's enough. Anyway, people do all kinds of crazy things though. So, um, oops, I think that slide there kind of messed up, but behind it is an old fashioned slide or picture that's just of an ice box. And people always come up to me and say, I don't eat oysters in the summer. It's not safe to eat oysters in the summer. And that's that old adage about not eating shellfish in months without an R. 
And so this is from the University of Maine site, and they say that is from when refrigeration was less available than today. So you don't have to worry about eating oysters in any particular month. You can eat them any month of the year. They are best in September, October, November, December, because that's when they're fattest. So they've built up all of their food supply to survive their hibernation in the winter. So they're really fat and really buttery at that time of year. But spring oysters and summer oysters are delicious as well. Um, I think they taste different in every season because everything is different in the water at those times. So, um, And then another question people are always worried about is how, how quickly do you have to eat them? And they are great. They're super hardy. They just close right up. And so that's why people can ship them. You can order oysters online from different farms throughout the state. And they are overnight shipped. And you can save them for up to 14 days just with a damp towel over. In the fridge. In the fridge, yeah. 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 What's the kindest way to to prepare them for being eaten? Um, kindest? Kindest. Quickest. <laughs> quickest, um, kindest. I usually, the easiest way to eat them, probably the kindest, is just to keep them, get them really cold. So you don't want to, um, like, you don't want to freeze them, mm -hmm. but if you just put them on ice for like an hour before you shuck them, they open up really easy and it's less of a battle. Um, the like shucking, shuckability of an oyster is also another category of what restaurants review and surface culture oysters are the easiest to shuck. Um, so that's another benefit. They're not as gnarly um, as some of the bottom grown ones that kind of fuse together really tightly. So um, the best thing about oysters, besides the fact that they taste great, is they're so good for the environment. So you're, um, by purchasing oysters, you're also helping support your local environment. They filter, one oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. So they are little ecosystem engineers and they filter out nitrogen. And so I'll get to that more in a second, but just by being on the shoreline, we're producing so much nitrogen um, with our gardens and with other human activity. And that nitrogen isn't um, harmful to people or to oysters, but it goes into the water with storms. And then that runoff creates algal blooms because you know nitrogen is good for your garden it's also good for the plankton in the water the plankton grows and multiplies and then it creates dead zones because it blocks the sunlight from what's on the bottom so oysters filter that and they help water clarity so then it's easier for things to grow um, much friendlier environment for the little ecosystems that exist around our coastal homes. So this is just kind of neat. One oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day, and a three-acre oyster farm filters out the equivalent nitrogen load produced by 35 coastal inhabitants. So um, huge benefit, and you might have heard of like the Billion Oyster Project in New York City, Towns are using oyster farms to help um, bring back really damaged waterways mm -hmm. um, with dead, with almost dead ecosystems. So here's the Billion Oyster Project. Um, they're putting a billion oysters in the water, mm -hmm. and that's helping bring back New York Harbor. And so people always ask, like, well, are they safe to eat them? Mm -hmm. And the nitrogen basically gets turned into like a harmless gas, but it's taken into the shell and excreted from the oyster, so it's not something that's going to harm you. It's kind of like you put nitrogen on your garden to help your carrots grow and then you eat your carrots. It's not something that's going to affect your you by consuming the oyster. Um, it basically just creates these algal blooms because it's feeding more and more plants at the surface of the water and then blocking out the sunlight beneath. So uh, they also help uh, reduce CO2. 
So this is an article that I just copied, and it says, shellfish motivation, the climate crisis could be solved with seas, not trees. <laughs> um, the current level of shellfish farming removes about 5.5 million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. So they incorporate CO2 into their shells as well. So great little creatures that help the environment and are good for you um, to eat. So exciting stuff there. Um, and I just have one more fact about the Chesapeake Bay. Because each oyster, one oyster can filter that much water, the oysters in the Chesapeake Bay could once filter a volume of water equal to that of the entire bay, about 19 trillion gallons in one week. Whoa. So today, because there's been um, so many reductions in traditional shellfish beds, just because of natural change and also human interference, it would take those remaining bay oysters more than a year to filter that water. Mm -hmm. So you can see how um, more shellfish is beneficial to whatever environment that they're in. And then we just have my coworkers <laughs> as our last slide. Thank you for coming and listening. And I'd love to take any questions that you have about oyster farming. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank thank you very much. <laughs> biggest mistake I've made is probably um, in the early years I was really operating in isolation and since then I've reached out for help um, in the industry and made a lot of connections and learned so much more than I would have just from reading and researching. So I think I, I wished that I'd done that earlier and it's a lot, also a lot more motivating too. Um, work with people, especially that have been in the industry a long time. Have you noticed a change in the flavor of the oysters that since you've been cultivating them? I think as I've become a better farmer, uh, the meat quality's gotten a, a lot better. So I have noticed that. Um, I haven't noticed. I have noticed just based on the site. I do have one um, customer, Dan Leaf at the Islesford Dock, who has a very sensitive palate, and he. <laughs> You know, when I'm talking about marijuana, it's like some people are going to notice that and really take a lot away from it, and some people won't. He noticed that I gave him oysters from a different site um, than I had been selling him earlier in the summer, so it was very, it was very like apparent to him that I was selling him oysters in the pool, and I was selling him oysters outside the pool, and he didn't have a negative toward either one. He just knew that they were from a different place, wow. so I think it's radically different even just, you know, yeah. 300 yards away. So I'm just curious, if someone wants to buy oysters from you directly, do you sell them directly or do you... This is a very them? regulated inter industry, so um, I sell, I'm able to sell oysters to people with a certain license, um, so I'm able to sell them at the general store, it's a holly, and so I have a sign-up sheet there, and I bring them in on Wednesdays and Fridays. So if you sign up there or call there, she can take your order. And I also have them at the Islesford Dock, um, but I, I'm not permitted to just like sell them individually to people. So it's a, uh, yeah, hopefully something I'll get on license for in the future. <laughs> yeah. Over the years, we uh, hear about red tides. Yes. Uh, and more relating to picking mussels. Yeah. And we're told not to eat them. I'm not sure if that's because the locals want them for themselves, but <laughs> uh, one way or another, we're told not to pick them when there's a red tide. Is, uh, it, it, how regular are the red tides and are they a threat? Um, they are, yes. Yeah. So there's different types of um, toxins that occur with those algal blooms, and red tide is a pretty serious one. And um, I, when I harvest oysters, I have to check um, the DMR website and they have a map there that lists what closures um, are up and usually mussels are closed. Um, oysters have been open the whole summer, but they can also close for bacterial, like if there's a huge um, rainstorm that's you know several days, they might close oysters just because of the runoff from coastal homes. You mean just for a few days or? 
Yeah, usually just for a few days. It depends. Uh, they do like water sampling and they actually will like take oysters from my farm to a lab before they would reopen. Um, so I haven't had any major closures, uh, but yeah, I do have to check and I do have to, I have mandatory reporting. And um, another place, another thing that you can check on the DMR website is it says there's just prohibited areas generally um, around high traffic points like the harbors or um, shorelines, especially shorelines where there's older homes that don't have septic systems. So all like growing area closures are like you can't grow anywhere around Sutton Island because there's a lot of older homes there that don't have septic systems. So I can show you that site so you can uh, check and make sure to <laughs> the town website has a link to that site oh great yeah the town website has a link to yeah the right because people like to go clamming and that kind of thing it's always good to know is there anything naturally occurring that could cause you to lose the crop yes yeah um there are like i haven't had anything up this way but like in the damariscata they'll have big uh, die-offs because of different diseases and that's been sort of contained through the Damascada. So I don't have anything here but there are those kind of things. Also just like errors that you can make in farming can kill a lot of oysters. Like gasoline or oil. Yes, yeah, that yeah. If there was like an oil spill it would kill them. Yeah, um, yeah. and if like you know someone, a big fear of mine is if someone came in and um, did like a sort of pump out of their boat on overboard Absolutely. discharge yeah, yeah that I would get just shut down for oh, weeks right, right. so and then the DMR is coming in and testing that to make sure that there's nothing like that in the water but that's definitely something that they're looking for um, yeah, but yeah big die-offs yeah big die-offs can happen from all kinds of things um, sometimes like if there's a lot of fresh water. If you're in a huge fresh water runoff, oysters can sustain that for a certain amount of time, but they can't, you know, they need salt water, mm -hmm. so. Lori? I was just wondering what you have found that you actually enjoy the most about what you're doing, uh, or some of the things that you enjoy about what you're doing. And also, do you have any kind of a um, thought to the future about doing any mentoring, you know, like uh, Stephanie Alla does with Carmen, we talked oh. to her about that. Are you thinking that you'll expand in any way like that? Um, yes. Yeah, I think that probably the thing that I enjoy most is just being on the water every day and being, you know, just paying attention to the environment. I love that. You know, I, I really enjoy teaching science, and so that's a really fun part of it for me. Um, also, I think I came to the island. I had so much excitement to put into something, and that was teaching and now I have oysters, so just like, you know, being in this point in my life and having all this excitement and putting something into a business that is mine is, is just so awesome. I love building that. Um, I think that that's a big goal of mine. Um, a role model is Barbara Scully, and she used to have something called Oyster Camp, and she would just employ like all of the 15 to 20 year olds like in her area because it's a, it's a great job where you're outside um, and you get a lot of boating confidence. So I'd love to be able to do something like that, you know, with young kids. Because you do the island. sailing program too, right? So. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing the sailing program this year. I'm just doing, helping them behind the scenes. I did a lot of grant writing for them, but um, it's Kim Turner who's running it this year. But yeah, that's always been a big goal of mine. I think that being able to drive boats and you know, get on and off the island more freely is a big key to being able to live here um, and empowering young people. So, <laughs> how long does it take for those little oysters to become one that you can eat? Probably about, like I say, about four years. But you know, you have—they're all growing at different rates. So you can have some as early as two years, and then some as late as five or six, it's just the majority come in around three to four. So how many did you buy initially to 
Initially, I bought 25,000. Wow. So it sounds like a big number, um, but a portion of those are going to die. Um, and you can count on as much as 50% mortality just naturally. And then um, a portion of those aren't sellable. Some of them cement together. And so you'll get like two oysters kind of stuck together. And that's what they do naturally. They kind of cement in clumps. Um, so a portion of them aren't sellable. And then so you, it's sort of a moving target. You have to figure out. That's one thing that I'm keeping track of to see what I can count on. So how, how many actually go to market right now? Right now, um, it's hard to say. Like, there's definitely demand for more, um, but I'm selling probably about 2,000 a week. Um, but it's a short season, so sure. that's my business is not making any money. So um, that's okay. I think I see the light at the end of the tunnel where I'll be able to make a profit, but I, I don't think that will be for a few years. You need years. more merch. Yeah, <laughs> more merch. <laughs> so, yeah. So to keep your oysters going, takes three years you know, to harvest an oyster, mm -hmm. you have to overwinter them somehow, right? So you yes. Yeah, so overwintering is a big risk. Um, so when I overwinter them, I sink them to the bottom, oh. and um, that's those cages that you saw have those pontoons on yeah. top, and I just unscrew the caps, and they're supposed to flip and then rest on the bottom, raised up out of the mud with the pontoons. Okay. So they're very heavy and a lot can go wrong when they sink, they kind of tumble. And if they land with the oysters down in the mud, the oysters can suffocate if they um, are respirating. So yeah. it's all about the timing and the temperature, getting them to land correctly. Um, mm. That's another mistake I made was sinking them too late. Um, in January and then not being able to get a diver to check them because it was too dangerous for people to dive right. in those temperatures. So those are all just things that are really hard mm -hmm. to uh, So get even if they land wrong, a diver can turn them over? A diver could turn them over, yep. And like I can turn them over with a gaff if they're shallow enough, but that's another thing that you have to watch out for is um, big tides in the middle of winter. If the oysters are exposed and the temperature is below zero, they'll die. So all those things are variables. So you start a new batch every year. I yeah, I put new batch in the water every year, and then hopefully it'll all just get rolling. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. How, how long do they live generally if they were just in the net growing in the wild? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I hope that I don't have any on my farm that are over six years old. But <laughs> yeah, wild. I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah. So, Lauren, I mean, you said right now you're not making a profit yeah. I guess, after, what, five years, but what what is it going to take for you to make a profit? Four years. What's going to change? Um, I think every year I'm just investing so much in equipment. So um, with scaling a farm, I just have to keep buying more cages, more gear, setting more moorings. Um, so once I get uh, the amount of gear that can sustain the oysters that I'm trying to get up to, then I think it will be... Uh, more profitable, but I also need more help. So it's, you know, I'll just find out, I guess. <laughs> but I'm excited about it, and I think, you know, it's definitely something I'm working for. I'm new to running a business, so that's been something I've gotten a lot of help with. Um, there's a great program in Maine that I've been using called SCORE, and they're really helpful um, for new business owners. So, mm. Oh, yeah. These people, if I go to Hardware Rock Cafe, I want a t shirt, right? Yeah, so, so exactly. <laughs> well, I was just saying I've been selling t shirts at Bar Road Market on Islesford, um, but I'll have to figure out a day where I can come over here and have like a one day t shirt sale or something. So, yeah. Just bring a bunch of them to the store, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Poor Holly. <laughs> She's got so much going on already. <laughs> 
Right here. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. But some in the boathouse. I'd be happy to sell oh, some for you. you. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah, I like Mommy when I see the t shirts. Yeah. Yeah. It's neat. People on Instagram have like taken pictures. Like I have one woman that bought one. She lives in Barcelona, and so she like took a picture of the oyster T-shirt. Yeah. So I was like, that's cool. They're traveling around. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have cranberry house merch. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah. Any other questions? There's lots of great questions. Yeah. I did have a customer have to get stitches this summer, so he had to get three stitches from opening an oyster, but I just think get a dish towel, you know, no fancy gloves or anything like that, just get a dish towel that you can wrap the oyster up in, and then when you go to open it, my favorite knife is probably the Toadfish knife, and they're a great company, they use all ocean recycled plastics, and um, there's just a little bit of a, like a bend at the end to make it a little easier to open the oyster. I sell Frenchman's knives, which have like a little guard so that if the knife slips, um, it should hit, the oyster should hit that guard. Because you can not only get cut by the knife, but also the oyster is very sharp. So both things are kind of sharp. <laughs> but, yeah. Can you set them on ice for an hour? Yeah, if you put them on ice for an hour, then they open up a little bit easier because they're so cold. They're like a little bit weakened. So um, that's the easiest way to open them. And then they're also nice and cold when you open the oyster. How many do you eat it when, and when sitting? I usually, I'm not like one of those people that can book back like 30 or 40. I usually just have a dozen. Um, and then I eat a lot just on the farm. You know, if I break one open or something like that, I'll have one, but yeah. I'm like not as crazy as some, <laughs> some of my customers like consume I think I had one lady that ordered four dozen every week so it was really cool <laughs> wow. really any order is great so if you order a dozen once a summer then you're supporting a local main business so and can you just remind me again when to order them I deliver on Wednesdays and Fridays so if you just call and get on the list like if you call Tuesday by three o'clock I'll deliver on Wednesday so you just have to make sure it's just before the delivery day so, yeah. Okay, well, um, I'm thrilled to have 